So, yeah, so first of all, thank you. Thanks a lot to the organizer of this uh, workshop. Uh, thanks a lot to, for giving me the opportunity to, to present this, uh, these results. Uh, so I'm a researcher uh, at LKB in the Optomechanics and Quantum Measurements group. And um, I'm going to tell you about experiments uh, where we are trying to demonstrate the non-classical behavior of a macroscopic mechanical resonator. So what you see here on this slide is uh, actually a silicon nitride membrane. So this is this very thin uh, blue object that can vibrate out of plane like a, like a drum. And what we are trying to achieve is um, to control the quantum states of such a system uh, to the point where it cannot be described by a positive Wigner function. And so to achieve this goal, uh, the approach that I'm going to present here relies, at least in part, on uh, the tools of uh, optomechanics. So, oh, yeah. Uh, so, in the simplest form, uh, you can think of the canonical optomechanical system as depicted on this cartoon. The mechanical resonator here uh, is used as the end mirror of an optical cavity, and so the mechanical motion will uh, modulate the length of this cavity. So it's, uh, there is rich dynamics in these systems because on the one hand, uh, the, the mirror will experience a force that is proportional to the intensity inside the cavity. So this is radiation pressure. And on the other hand, by moving, uh, the motion will uh, modulate the, the frequency uh, of the cavity. So historically, this uh, kind of optomechanical coupling was studied in the context of uh, interferometric measurements because combined with the quantum noises of light, uh, this radiation pressure interaction gives rise to fundamental limits in the, the precision of the interferometer. So in this case, the optomechanical coupling is rather a disturbance to the measurement sensitivity. And one of the big activity of our group is to uh, develop a squeezed light source that is compatible uh, with uh, gravitational wave interferometers to, to enhance the sensitivity of advanced Virgo. On the other hand, a big experimental effort is going on uh, to use radiation pressure as a resource uh, to control the quantum state of a micromechanical system. So you can see here several examples of a micromechanical oscillator that have been cooled using radiation pressure uh, close to their quantum ground state. So this whispering gallery mode resonator where the optomechanical coupling occurs between the light circulating uh, in the cavity here and internal vibrational mode of the structure. Here, this is a photonic uh, crystal cavity where uh, the photonic crystal is, is used to confine at the same time uh, phonons and photons in the same very small mode volume. And here, the third system that you see is a, 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 of the electromechanical, microwave electromechanical category. Essentially, the vibrating element is this aluminum plate that is sitting on a vacuum gap. And that will essentially modulate uh, the value of a capacitor and hence the, the frequency of a microwave resonator. So the, the, the inductor here is this, uh, this line that form actually a, a spiral. So the experiments I'm, I'm going to describe belong to this uh, last category. Uh, so experiments where uh, mechanical motion actually modulates the frequency of uh, a microwave uh, degree of freedom. And in spite of the, uh, like the, the apparent diversity of these systems, like in geometry and also the mass here spans more than 10 orders of magnitude, they are essentially all described by the same Hamiltonian, which is uh, depicted here. So here A is the annihilation of photons inside uh, the electromagnetic cavity and B is the operator for uh, phonons inside the mechanical resonator. Uh, here G0 is a parameter that describes uh, the, the strength of this interaction at the Hamiltonian level. It's called the vacuum uh, optomechanical coupling rate and essentially what, what this describes is how much the frequency of the optical cavity uh, fluctuates due to the zero point fluctuation of the mechanical system. And so uh, the first remark that, that we should make is that 
the frequency of the two harmonic oscillators that are coupled by this Hamiltonian are, are, are very different. Uh, for instance, in the experiment I'm going to present, the mechanical system is vibrating around a megahertz, while uh, the microwave cavity is typically in the 10 to the 10 hertz. And the first consequence of this is, is a thermodynamical one. Uh, because of this very small uh, mechanical frequency, the, the, the mechanical resonator is coupled to a thermal bath with a, a very large thermal occupation, while the microwave field, if, if we are able to thermalize the system in a uh, dilution fridge environment, is it, close to, is coupled, it essentially sees a bath with zero occupation. Um, the other thing is that usually this, this G naught, this coupling is too small. It's much smaller than the frequency of the mechanical resonator and the damping of the optical cavity. So it's too small to observe the effect of single photons uh, in the system. So the, the approach that people are usually following uh, is the linear regime of optomechanics. So the idea is to pump the optical cavity with a, uh, a strong classical uh, field. Uh, of coherent amplitude alpha, and then look for the linearized dynamics around the steady state. So essentially what we do is we, uh, we replace operator A by the displaced operator A plus alpha. And if we do that, we end up with this linearized Hamiltonian where essentially the, the coupling has been enhanced by a factor that is proportional to alpha. But on the other hand, uh, now the, the coupling becomes uh, linear uh, between the two systems. So uh, an interesting, another interesting consequence of the fact that we have so different uh, frequencies is that it's, it's going to be very easy to, uh, to choose which terms are going to be resonant in this Hamiltonian by simply uh, tuning uh, the frequency of this uh, classical drive. So for instance, if we set um, the, the drive frequency exactly one mechanical frequency below uh, the microwave resonance, we end up uh, with this uh, exchange Hamiltonian, where essentially we can swap phonons and photons. Uh, and essentially the dynamics of the system described by this uh, beam splitter Hamiltonian is exactly the same as the fields at the input uh, of a beam splitter. On the other end, if we set the pump uh, one mechanical frequency above, the energy of the uh, pump photons exactly uh, coincides with the sum of uh, a resonant photon, the, free, the energy of a resonant photon and the phonon. So you can generate pairs of photons and phonons. And so the dynamics this time is really equivalent to that of the field in inside a non-degenerate uh, OPO. And so this uh, essentially, this gives us a comprehensive set of tools uh, to manipulate the quantum state of the mechanical system. For instance, we can use this interaction to, to cool the mechanical system by essentially swapping uh, the hot mechanical uh, thermal state uh, with the, the cold uh, electromagnetic state, or uh, we can entangle uh, photons and phonons using this, uh, uh, this beam splitter, uh, this uh, parametric down conversion interaction. However, because these Hamiltonians are linear, they only uh, couple one uh, operator of each system uh, together. And, and because we are dealing with uh, fully harmonic oscillators, uh, there is no way to create a non-Gaussian uh, state starting from uh, merely Gaussian states such as thermal states or vacuum. And for this, we need an extra nonlinear element. And as uh, I guess people in the audience know very well, um, a very good example is a uh, a, a photon resolving detector. So for instance, with propagating laser beam, uh, what you would do is to generate uh, entangled uh, twin beams like that, um, where there's a small probability uh, to emit a pair of photons in the two beams. And then if you detect a click uh, on the detector here, you know that you've immediately projected uh, the other beam on a single photon Fox state. So this is of course a probabilistic uh, preparation method because you only get uh, a probability epsilon square uh, to count a click in this experiment. However, as soon as you count the click, you know that you've projected your system in the desired quantum state. So the, optim the optomechanical version of this experiment uh, basically has demonstrated recently uh, in the optical domain uh, by the group of, um, uh, of Simon Groblacher uh, 
in, in, in this version, you replace the, the propagation along the path of the beam by a sequence uh, of steps. So the, the preparation, essentially, you would first uh, cool the mechanical resonator by uh, using uh, this red side band pulse that, that essentially uh, cools the mechanical system in its ground state. Then the entanglement, you switch on a pump on the blue side band, which generates this uh, uh, entangled state between the, the propagating microwave field and uh, the mechanical system. And at the same time, you just detect the field uh, at the output field of the, of the system. And if you count the click, then you can make the, the, later on the tomography of the, of the mechanical state. So of course, a key ingredient uh, for this experiment is a photon uh, resolving detector. So uh, you need a detector that's sensitive to uh, this quadratic quantity in the field of the operators and in the optical domain uh, where the energy of the photons is essentially uh, sufficient to trigger uh, like irreversible phenomena like uh, uh, photo ionization. Uh, these are commercially available. However, in the microwave domain, uh, uh, the, the, the essentially the, there are only a few proof of principle which all relies on uh, various schemes that will uh, convert the incoming photons into an excitation of a superconducting qubit. Uh, so uh, very important uh, figures of merit for the detector are uh, the dark count probability, that is the, the probability to count a click even though uh, there was just the vacuum at the input of the detector and the inefficiency, the probability to uh, not count a click, uh, even though there was a, a photon at the input. And there is the common uh, conception that what is most important is the efficiency of the detector. However, for this heralded scheme, heralded scheme preparation, uh, the dark count uh, is probably uh, a, a very important uh, parameter as dark count essentially will end up in mixing the interesting state uh, with the, the Gaussian state that you started with. So this will directly affect uh, the fidelity uh, of, of the prepared, prepared state, whereas the inefficiency will simply lower the, the success rate of your experiment. So in this talk, I will describe first um, the, the optomechanical, the, the electromechanical system that uh, we are developing at LKB. Um, and then in the second part, uh, I will describe work that we that have been carried out in collaboration with uh, the group of Zaki Lektas and Emmanuel Fleurin uh, at LPNS, uh, where uh, we, we come, came up with a, um, an original scheme uh, to realize Micro, single microwave photon detector with very low dark count rate in the microwave domain. Um, okay, so first of all, I'd like to motivate why uh, we are using this silicon nitride membrane. And so in this graph, uh, you can see here uh, on the vertical axis, uh, the quality factor. So this tells you how much uh, the, the, the mode is decoupled basically from its noisy uh, thermal environment. And on the horizontal axis, this is a zero point fluctuation. So that's a quantity that scales as uh, one over square root of the mass times the frequency uh, of the system. And so that tells you how easy it is to couple uh, your mechanical resonator to other systems, and in particular to uh, electromagnetic field in the context of, of optomechanics. And what you see in this graph is that you have this kind of depressing trend where essentially, as you go towards uh, nanoscopic systems, so this is here nano, uh, nano wire. Here on the left, you have these Weber bars and, and bulk acoustic wave quartz resonator. And so as you decrease uh, the dimension of the system, so to, to, to basically enhance the zero point fluctuation, you at the same time uh, reduce uh, the quality factor. And, and this is a sign that most of these systems are, are, are dominated by uh, surface losses. So actually, if we look closer, uh, since a few years, there are a certain class of resonators uh, that seems to miraculously uh, evade this trend. So these resonators that have been pioneered by the group of Jack Harris are silicon nitride, membranes, and uh, string. Uh, 
Um, and the physical phenomenon really that's behind uh, this new trend uh, is called dissipation dilution. And it is directly traceable to the fact that you can deposit silicon nitride uh, with a very large tensile stress. So to understand this phenomenon, uh, let's consider a square membrane of side L and thickness H uh, that would be clamped. Uh, so here, for instance, on the silicon frame at the four edges. And by definition, so the quality factor is uh, the, the ratio between the elastic energy that is stored in the deformation of the material divided by the energy that it's lost at each uh, oscillation cycle. So if we interest ourselves first to this uh, stored energy, so let's take an elementary uh, element of volume in the material. And this uh, volume element is going to be deformed uh, when, the, when the membrane vibrates. And so uh, in the absence of pre-stress, essentially, there is basically no deformation when the, when the membrane is at rest, such that the element of volume sits uh, at the origin of this stress strain diagram. And uh, now, when the membrane starts to oscillate, essentially, uh, the, the element will start to be stretched in this case. And then, uh, half a period of oscillation later, uh, the, you will have the opposite constraint. It will be, it will be strained. And essentially, as the membrane oscillates, uh, this point will uh, follow this segment in the stress strain diagram. And so the, the, the length of this uh, segment essentially depends on two things. First of all, the distance from the middle, so which is highlighted here by this uh, blue, blue line, the distance of your volume element from this uh, middle line, and the mode curvature at the point uh, of your volume element. Um, and so, um, now we can calculate the bending energy stored in, in this volume element at the maximum displacement of the membrane. And this is given by the integral of the stress uh, time strain uh, over a quarter of a period. So essentially, this is given by the area of this blue triangle. And now if we want uh, to evaluate the energy that are lost over a period, we need to come up with a phenomenological model for the losses. And so a good model here, when the system is dominated by internal loss, is this Zener model, where essentially the, the Young's modulus acquires uh, an imaginary part, which describes the fact that the stress is slightly delayed uh, compared to the, the strain uh, in, the, in the material. So in this case, the, the the point in the stress strain diagram is, is going to follow an ellipse like that. And the work uh, uh, that is lost at every uh, oscillation period is then given by the, the area, this, the area of this ellipse uh, here. So the, the quality factor is just simply given in the absence of pre-stress by the ratio between uh, this blue triangle and this, and this ellipse. And this quantity actually only depends, in this case, on the real and imaginary part of Young's modulus. And this is, by definition, called the intrinsic quality factor of the material, which is uh, on the order of 6,000 only uh, for silicon nitride. However, uh, this equality between the intrinsic quality factor of the material and the modes quality factor only holds in the absence of pre-stress. If you start now to apply pre-stress to the membrane, as, as you would do, for instance, with a, a drum skin or a guitar string, you end up displacing the point in the stress strain diagram. And now, uh, if the membrane moves exactly with the same amplitude, the energy lost at each uh, cycle uh, has exactly uh, the same uh, dependence. It's, it's related, actually, to the bending energy as before. However, there is this extra contribution to the stored energy, uh, which is essentially stored in the elongation of the material. And so this uh, is essentially energy that is uh, essentially lossless that we get for free, and which is going to uh, allow uh, us to dilute the, the, the internal losses of the material. So essentially, the quality factor in the presence of pre-stress is going to be diluted by this factor. Uh, and so this dilution factor 
is the product of two terms, one term which corresponds, which is proportional to the stress of the membrane. So in our uh, membrane system, the stress is close to one gigapascal. So this is very close to the yield stress of the material. For instance, this would correspond to uh, suspending a 100 kilogram uh, mass to, to a guitar string. And then this other term here is the aspect ratio. We can really uh, understand pretty well, well the, why the aspect ratio plays a role here, because essentially uh, bending energy is, is dominant for a volume element that are far away from the center of, uh, of the membrane. So if the membrane is thinner, you have less of these uh, elements in, in, inside it. And so here again, we have very, very um, uh, large aspect ratio uh, resonator because the membrane is typically 100 nanometer thick and like three millimeter in length. So as a comparison, if, if the Golden Gate Bridge would have the same aspect ratio, uh, it, it would basically uh, have a thickness of only 10 centimeters. So essentially, the, uh, in theory, the, the dilution factors here, square root lambda that we should get in this system should be close to 600. So you have a 600 increase compared to the intrinsic quality factor of silicon nitride. So we've learned how to fabricate this silicon nitride membrane in the lab. We start from a uh, silicon wafer coated with silicon nitride on both sides. And then we uh, etch uh, selectively a silicon nitride by uh, the silicone, sorry, um, by dipping the, the sample in hot potassium hydroxide for 18 hours. So we do this in these custom made holders um, and basically, we, we fabricate these batches of uh, nine membrane uh, at a time. So then uh, we characterize first at room temperature uh, uh, this mechanical resonator in a shot noise limited interferometer, thanks to a balanced homodyne detection. Um, and so in reality, the interferometer looks like that. You see it's a fully monolithic design uh, built in a cage system. Um, and the, the, basically, the whole interferometer is mounted on a translation stage that allows to, to essentially scan the interferometer with respect to the sample and to, and to measure all nine samples at once without the need to open the, 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 vacuum, uh, the vacuum tank. Moreover, by scanning the position of the interferometer, we can essentially raster scan the position of the laser on the resonator and perform a tomography like that of the vibration profiles of the membrane. So the, the resolution of the interferometer is sufficient to see actually the Brownian motion of the various membrane modes at room temperature. So uh, this, these are these various peaks that you see here um, in, the, in the noise spectrum. And so these are the experimentally reconstructed uh, vibration profile that match pretty well with uh, the simulations. We then can measure uh, the quality factors of the membrane in a, uh, by performing ring down measurements. So what we do is we modulate first the intensity of the laser beam with a, an AOM. Uh, so this, we, we modulate it resonantly with a vibrational mode. So this is this first part. And then we uh, stop the modulation and just look at the, uh, how the, the vibration uh, decays down uh, in the system. So the quality factor here uh, corresponding to this measurement is, is uh, a bit more than a million. And so this is within a factor two from uh, the, the values that, that is predicted by this dissipation dilution theory that I, I presented here. So actually what we will see is that this value increase also dramatically at cryogenic temperatures. So for this, we place the membranes um, in a, an electromechanical uh, setup. So essentially, uh, the microwave part of the circuit is located on this uh, separate chip. Um, the, essentially, the, the, the membrane will be uh, brought in, in close uh, vicinity of this microwave circuit thanks to these aluminum spacers that are uh, typically less than a micron thick. And so the interesting part is this resonator that we see here. If we zoom in, uh, we see that we have two parts. We have this uh, capacitive part, these two uh, niobium capacitive pads, and here this meander, which actually is a, a, an inductor, and this forms an, an LC, a lumped LC resonator. We have also this transmission line that allows to send uh, 
microwave signal in and out of the resonator. Then we uh, essentially coat, so you see here the, the, the mechanical uh, sample, the membrane, uh, with a, a niobium pad that is uh, deposited here. And once we bring the two chips to, together in a flip chip geometry, essentially this uh, superconducting pad is going to come in front uh, uh, of this uh, capacitor. And you realize this, uh, this moving gap capacitor where essentially the, the value of this capacitance depends on the on the position of the membrane. So if we draw, if we make a cut through this, essentially the, the flip ship assembly look, looks like that. Um, we, we are able to make uh, gaps between the two chips on the order of uh, less than a micron, actually. Uh, and actually an, uh, an important technological aspect is that we need to essentially etch all the surfaces that are not uh, useful. And this, this is essentially to reduce the probability that the dust uh, becomes squeezed between the two, the two chips. So we then uh, place the sample inside the sample holder and then measure it in, inside a dilution fridge. So the data that I'm going to show uh, in this presentation have been uh, measured uh, in, a, in a fridge uh, that was gratefully uh, landed by this group of Zaki Lectas at ENS because at the time we didn't have yet uh, dilution, dilution fridge uh, in our lab. So essentially what we are going to do is that we are going to drive the system. So we thermalize uh, the microwave drive uh, to reduce the thermal noise uh, here with, with, that, with various attenuators at the different stage of the fridge and we amplify the, the signal. So the first thing we do is we reproduce the ring down measurements at low temperature. So for this we send essentially two microwave tones that are separated by the mechanical frequency. So the bit node between these two uh, tones will create uh, intensity modula modulation that will drive the mechanical uh, resonator into motion. And then as before, we switch off the modulation and simply read the mechanical uh, motion with a, a red sideband that essentially converts uh, the mechanical uh, phonons into, into, optic, into microwave photons. And so what you see here uh, is the decay of this, uh, uh, of this mechanical amplitude. And the important thing to notice is the, the x-axis here, which is in seconds. So actually, um, uh, you, uh, you can have coherent oscillation for uh, even minutes uh, in this system. And so uh, the quality factor here at, at low temperature is, is around 300 millions. Uh, and so the, this huge boost of, uh, uh, of the quality factor at cryogenic temperature, which has also been observed uh, in the group of uh, Gary Steele, corresponds to, to the fact that the, the intrinsic properties, the intrinsic quality factor actually of the silicon nitride uh, likely uh, gets much better at cryogenic temperatures. So in fact, even if you uh, consider the fact that uh, this system is coupled to uh, an environment with a, a non-zero uh, occupation. Uh, you can see that the coherence time uh, of, of the system uh, exceeds actually the, the best microwave resonator. Um, and, and, and actually the, the interesting thing is that it's a very compact uh, chip scale system in this case. So this is very interesting system also uh, uh, in the context of uh, quantum engineering, for instance, to be used as a quantum memory. And so now what happens if we increase uh, this readout pulse, we start to see that essentially the, the, the effective lifetime of the mechanical resonator decreases. And this is actually the effect of electromechanical uh, dumping, the fact that you are converting uh, mechanical phonons into photons. And so you are adding uh, a microwave dumping uh, to your mechanical resonator. And so now we can study this effect uh, in the frequency domain. So we wait uh, for the mechanics to, to reach the steady state. And um, then we just uh, send the, the, the output microwave field into a spectrum analyzer. And, and we see this spectrum, this very narrow peak that you see here is uh, actually the, the, the thermal noise of the, uh, of the membrane. And as you uh, increase uh, the pump power, you uh, see two effects. Uh, 
So first of all, you see that the the the, the peaks becomes wider. So this this is essentially the the frequency domain counterpart of uh, of the effect we just saw before. The the, the damping, the, the effective damping increases, and at the same time, the area below the peak uh, decreases. Uh, essentially, it is a, this is a log scale, and so this is a sign that we are cooling uh, effectively the, the mechanical. So if we plot here as a function of the pump power, um, the, the effective uh, temperature as, as uh, inferred from the area below these curves, we see, uh, so we have actually a, a, a good news and a not so good news. The good news is that we are able to achieve cooling factor by uh, three orders of, uh, cool this membrane by three orders of magnitude. So in principle, this should be enough to, uh, to, to be deep inside uh, the ground state, starting from uh, uh, the, uh, the thermal population uh, at 10 millikelvin. However, the bad news is that the, the initial temperature we start with is not 10 millikelvin, but it, it's rather uh, above a Kelvin. And this is attributed to the fact that uh, we are essentially seeing vibrations uh, caused by uh, the pulse tube of the of the dilution fridge. So to solve this uh, this problem, there are several approaches. There is this uh, passive damping uh, uh, of the whole uh, cryostat stage, as we saw before. Another very interesting strategy that we are uh, exploring right now is to apply phononic engineering strategies. So the idea is to is to decouple uh, the vibrating system from uh, the, the, the noisy environment by uh, using phononic crystal decoupling. So, uh, by the way, there is a poster by uh, Edouard Ivanov uh, that I encourage you to, to see for more details on this. But so ex essentially, the, uh, these phononic crystal membranes uh, uh, that, that, we, that we fabricate in the lab looks like that. So, we essentially uh, uh, took inspiration from this work by uh, Albert Schlisser in Copenhagen. So here, the phononic crystal is directly etched uh, inside the silicon nitride membrane. And if we look at this purely periodic uh, region, so this represents uh, a phononic crystal with a, a well-defined band gap uh, for out-of-plane modes of vibration. So essentially, uh, vibrations in this frequency range uh, cannot propagate or will be exponentially damped in this uh, phononic crystal. And if we engineer uh, defect in the center with the proper uh, proper engineering. Uh, well, we can uh, manage to have localized defect mode that are sitting exactly uh, within this band gap, and uh, we can clearly see uh, the localized defect modes as a series of discrete peaks sitting on a very uh, quiet background. Uh, so this is what happens when we measure the displacement spectrum at room temperature and the optical interferometer uh, close to the center of the membrane. <clears throat> so actually, we can once again uh, perform a raster scan, the mode tomography of these defect modes. So this is what we measure by scanning the laser in, uh, in this region. And these are the simulated mode profiles. So uh, we have a very good understanding of, of what those modes are. are. And uh, note that in, in our experiments, uh, we will be mostly interested by this D1 mode, which has the maximum displacement at the center uh, of the membrane. So an extra benefit uh, of this phononic crystal membrane is the fact that uh, not only we hope it's going to decouple uh, the, the, the mode of interest from uh, acoustic vibrations, but also it should lead to a, uh, an enhanced dissipation dilution. So the reason for that, uh, so uh, I want to come back a little bit to the comparison between a square membrane and this uh, phononic crystal membrane. So if we look at the displacement profile for uh, square membranes, so we see that essentially this displacement membrane uh, at first sight doesn't depend on uh, the stress essentially on the, on the dilution factor. Uh, it looks pretty much the same. However, if we zoom in a very small region close to the uh, clamping point of the membrane due to the boundary condition, uh, we have this very uh, sharp kink here uh, that essentially becomes sharper and sharper as you increase uh, the dilution factor of the stress. Uh, 
And this is actually very bad because here now I'm plotting the curvature of the mod profile, so second derivative of the profile as a function of, uh, of x. And you see that this kink becomes higher and higher as you uh, increase uh, the stress. And so uh, the reasoning that we made earlier, that essentially the energy that is stored in elongation grows as lambda, where, whereas the energy stored in bending remains the same is, is not totally correct for this kind of system because the energy stored in bending actually depends also uh, on the stress. And actually, if you do the math correctly, you see that the energy stored in bending uh, scales as the square root of this parameter lambda. And that's why at the end of the day, the Q factor scales also as the square root of uh, this dilution factor lambda. On the other hand, in, a, in this soft clamping resonator, uh, what you have is that uh, the vibrations are exponentially damped away from the defect such that they're essentially the, the defect mode doesn't see uh, the, the clamping condition and uh, essentially uh, the bending uh, energy of the membrane is independent of stress such that you get in the end the full uh, dilution factor lambda instead of, uh, of square root lambda. So you can actually calculate uh, what the bending loss uh, should be in your system by simply integrating the curvature over the mode profile. So this is done numerically and we expect uh, for our membrane parameter at room temperature, a quality factor of, of 15,000. And so what we get is uh, this. So you have several uh, membranes that have been measured. So the different colors of the point correspond to the different uh, vibration modes of the defect. And so what you see is that for mode D2 and D3 are actually quite close from the, uh, the, the, the value expected from this dissipation dilution. But for the mode D1, we saw, we, we, we scratched our head for some time because we saw some, a lot of dispersion in the quality factor of this pump. And actually we understood what was going on when we started to look at the vibration profile close to the edge of the membrane. So we displaced again our interferometer in this region. And we saw that in addition to the defect mode, uh, we have here like a, a forest of modes. And these modes correspond to edge modes of the structure close to the edge. Uh, you don't have any more perfectly uh, periodic uh, pattern. The, the symmetry is broken and you can have edge modes uh, that are simulated here. And these edge modes essentially are going to hybridize with uh, your defect mode. And essentially at the end of the day, when this happens, uh, you get a quality factor, uh, which is the, uh, the average between the two, uh, the, the, the two kinds of modes. So this is confirmed by doing the, the tomography of the different modes. Uh, essentially, the, the D1 mode uh, we see, especially for uh, the samples where we have this uh, strong reduction of the quality factor, is actually, is actually strongly hybridized uh, with uh, vibrational mode located on the edge. So how can we manage to, uh, to avoid this problem? So well, we, we came up with this solution of adding uh, several arrays of holes here. So essentially what this is doing is this pushing up the frequency uh, of these edge modes such that they uh, don't uh, coincide anymore with the interesting mode for us, the D1 mode. They are, all these edge modes are, are now higher in frequency. And so you see that we get now uh, much more reproducible result for the D1 mode. Of course, this comes at the price that the D2 and D3 modes are, have a tendency to hybridize because now uh, frequency of these edge modes uh, coincide with, uh, with that of the higher excited mode of the, of the defect. So now this is actually very good news. Uh, we see that uh, the average quality factor of the mode of interest is, is within a factor of two of uh, the, uh, the optimal mode predicted by, by dissipation dilution. Um, and uh, essentially, uh, more than 50% of the samples are, are, are um, what we call good samples that have at least, uh, at least within 50% of this optimal quality factor. So, uh, of course, uh, so what we are working at uh, right now is to integrate this uh, phononic, uh, this softly clamped membrane in our uh, electromechanical experiments. And keep in mind that we ex expect a similar uh, boost of the quality factor at cryogenic temperatures. 
so um, that's more or less what I uh, wanted to present on uh, these electromechanical experiments. Uh, and now I would like to use the, the few uh, time that is left in this presentation to talk about uh, this work that we did in collaboration with LPENS uh, to realize a very low dark count single microwave photon detectors. So here we are going to, uh, to now use really the tools of, uh, of superconducting uh, circuits with Josephson junctions uh, to essentially count microwave photons with uh, very high efficiency and low dark count. So our goal uh, is uh, to, to, to make a, a photon detector that, that is able to catch photons irrespective of the temporal waveform of the photons. Uh, and for that, we came up with a, a scheme, an original scheme exploiting reservoir engineering to efficiently convert the incoming photon here into a qubit excitation. So the schematic of the detector is, is depicted here. Um, and it is composed of a, a transmond qubit that is sandwiched in between uh, two uh, linear resonators, a buffer resonator, uh, B, and a, and a waste resonator, uh, frequency omega W. And um, essentially, the, the two resonators here are very strongly overcoupled to this transmission line such that they are very low uh, quality factor. And we are, in particular, we are going to use the waste as our uh, cold reservoir uh, for, uh, for this reservoir engineering. So what we do is that now we pump the system at a, at a well-chosen frequency here. So omega W is the, the frequency of the waste, omega sigma, the frequency of the qubit, and omega B, the buffer frequency. And in a way that is pretty similar to what we are used to in optomechanics, we end up amplifying uh, essentially the, the, these two energy conserving terms in uh, the Hamiltonian uh, of the Josephson junction. So what these terms tell us essentially, um, essentially if, if we focus on this one, essentially you have uh, annihilation operator of uh, one photon here, creation of an excitation in the qubit, and creation of a photon in the way. So what this, this process is, when a photon arrives on the buffer cavity, it can jump to the waste cavity and at the same time excite the qubit. And so this is essentially how we are going to uh, detect this photon. At the end of the experimental second sequence, we can simply read out the state of the qubit. And if we find the qubit in the excited state, it means that a, a photon has entered the system in the process. So the very imp uh, important thing about this process is that uh, the, the, the reciprocal process here, uh, the Hermitian conjugate, essentially you see that uh, this is the process that would require an excitation in the qubit and an excitation in this waste cavity uh, to be allowed. And because this weight cavity is very strongly coupled to uh, this uh, measurement line, uh, essentially, as soon as an excitation is created in here, it escapes uh, such that the reciprocal process is totally forbidden. So actually, we can uh, make this argument uh, a bit more formal. Uh, we start for this from uh, this parametrically uh, activated Hamiltonian. We add up the loss operator for uh, the waste cavity. And now if we perform the adiabatic elimination of the waste mode, we end up with this non-local loss operator. Uh, it is non-local in the sense that you have uh, essentially two uh, operators for, for this buffer cavity and the qubit. So what this uh, loss operator describes is the fact that if you have a, a photon inside this cavity, it is going to decay uh, down. Uh, and at the same time, the qubit is going to decay uh, exponentially towards uh, its excited state. So essentially what's going on is that the qubit population PE uh, integrates uh, the buffer, the buffer uh, occupation. So here is how the device actually looks like. Uh, it's made actually of uh, uh, standard uh, microwave circuit uh, elements. The buffer and the waste are made from a lambda over four resonator. And you have here in the center uh, the, the transmond qubit. Um, 
uh, that can be pumped via this uh, external line. So to operate the detector, what we basically do is we, we switch on this parametric interaction by switching on the pump. Uh, and essentially this time is, is, is the time, uh, the detection window, the time over which you, you are going to be able to detect incoming photons. Eventually we send uh, a very weak pulse at the input of the buffer cavity. Um, and finally, at the end of the sequence, we read out the state of the qubit to know whether we have detected a photon or not. So we, uh, we didn't have a, a single photon source, uh, but instead we've uh, calibrated uh, precisely uh, the, the flux of photons arriving on the buffer cavity and we've sent a very weak coherent pulses. And you see here as a function of the number of photons in the coherent state, uh, the probability to find the qubit in the excited states. Uh, we can now plot exactly the same data, uh, but this time as a function one minus p zero. So the probability to have uh, to not have the vacuum state inside this coherence state, and essentially the efficiency of the detector corresponds to the slope uh, of this uh, at the beginning of the curve. And here, I think for this two microsecond detection window, we get an efficiency of fifty eight percent. Actually, by uh, repeating this experiment uh, for various duration of the pulse, uh, we see that uh, we have a pretty good efficiency over a very different uh, pulse shape. And actually, we have a very good understanding of the, uh, of the, of the noises and the limitations of the system. So here, you can see the effect of the qubit lifetime. Uh, simply, this is the fact that if you're uh, if your uh, qubit gets excited at the beginning of the pulse, uh, of course, after some time, if, the, if this pulse is comparable to the qubit lifetime, it's going to decay away and you lose efficiency. Uh, the red curve, the green curve, sorry, corresponds to the fact that uh, the buffer cavity has a finite bandwidth. And if the pulse here is too short, essentially, it, it will have Fourier components that are uh, rejected by the input cavity. And finally, this. Uh, red lines correspond to the fact that uh, there is a, a, a mode matching uh, condition inside the buffer cavity. Essentially, this, uh, uh, this parametric process corresponds to a, a, a loss process for the cavity, and you need the input mirror of the cavity to match exactly this uh, nonlinear loss process. Uh, and this happens when these two effective dumping uh, are, are exactly the same. And this was not the case in our experiment. Uh, and essentially, this factor would have limited us to, to 0 0.8. So however, the message here is that we have a, a pretty good uh, quantum efficiency uh, in this experiment, and that we have a detector that is waveform insensitive. So now let's look at the uh, real advantage of these schemes, which appears when we look at the dark count rate. So essentially, the advantage is that we expect uh, uh, that there is not really, uh, except for environmental heating of the qubit, there is not an obvious process that triggers dark count uh, in this scheme. And so you see here that the dark count rate uh, stays at a very low level, even for very long uh, detection windows. So this is in stark contrast with, for instance, experiments uh, with Ramsey interferometry, where essentially after a defacing time of the qubit, uh, you end up at 50% chance to find the qubit uh, in the excited state. So actually, these uh, numbers are typically, essentially, the short time dark count rate is typically an order of magnitude uh, below the state of the art. OK, so this is my, uh, essentially, my last slide. Um, so an interesting aspect of this detector is that uh, the photon that is detected here uh, in the detector is not destroyed in the process. As we said, the photon escape through this waste cavity. And so instead of uh, discarding this information, we can actually amplify and uh, monitor uh, this propagating photon. And so this is what we have done. We have used this, uh, this actually nice technique from uh, Laura's group to find the, the waveform, the temporal waveform of the photon rejected by the, by the, the system. And then we perform the tomography uh, of this photon. Uh, 
so we, we sort the data, of course, in two categories, whether we've detected the qubits in the ground state. So there we should find, recover the, 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 essentially the ground state in this channel. And if, the, if we counted a click in the detector, here we, uh, we, ob we obtain uh, a very nice uh, single photon Fox state. So I should mention here that we've calibrated uh, the measurement, uh, the losses of the measurement chain, and this is the state uh, inferred uh, directly at the output of the, uh, of the waste cavity. So the fidelity of this uh, state is close to 81%. So in fact, what I'm showing here is the simplest heralding experiment that we can perform uh, with such a detector. Okay, so yes, in summary, uh, I've shown uh, our progress towards the development of an electromechanical system uh, with an ultra-coherent silicon nitride membrane. Uh, I've shown experiments at room temperature with a QF product of 10 to the 12. Uh, so 10 to 12 at, at 20 millik, cooling factor of 1000. I found a progress uh, towards edge guarded photonic crystal membrane. And here the QF product already uh, is larger than 10 to 13 at room temperature. And we're still uh, needing to, to characterize these uh, membranes at low temperature. Uh, a single microwave photon detector with very low dark count rate, uh, efficient, and that is also waveform independent. So the next step are to test the uh, acoustic isolation of phononic shielded membrane in an electromechanical cavity and, and hopefully the preparation of non gaussian states with this system. OK, so with this, I, I'd like to thank you uh, for your attention. I hope we still have some time for questions. <laughs>